a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jan Reichert, Executive Director of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members, as well as the broader scientific community about topics relating to antibody discovery and development. Our speaker today is Dr. Bjorn Kokluvius, who is an expert in the preclinical development of antibody therapeutics. Today, he will tell us all about the data packages that are needed for these molecules while they're in the preclinical phase. Before he educates us on this topic, though, I'll take just a minute or two to show you a few graphs meant to put this information in the context of what happens next. Hence the title of my first slide, Preclinical Development of Antibodies, the sequel. Please note the webinar is being recorded. My slides, as well as the slides from Dr. Kuklovius, can be downloaded from the materials tab in the viewer. Please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer, and Dr. Kuklovius will answer these at the end of the webinar. So let's start with the sequel to the main event. If you generate a successful preclinical pre package, you will join a large number of antibodies that are already in the clinical pipeline or your molecule will. So first you'll have the evaluation at phase one. And as you can see from this graph, you'll have lots of company as some 465 unique antibody therapeutics are being evaluated at that stage. If all goes well, then the molecule will enter phase two, which is also a bit crowded with over 300 molecules that are at that stage. If all goes well again, the molecule moves on to late stage studies where efficacy is hopefully established. Relative to the numbers in phase one and two, the number of phase three may look a little bit small to you, but I can assure you that historically speaking, that is not a small number. And I can tell you that with some authority because I've been tracking the late stage pipeline of antibody therapeutics since 2010 and writing an article every single year. The Antibodies to Watch article series was started in 2010 by documenting 26 antibodies that were at that stage at that time. I am working with my co-authors now on the subsequent <laughs> antibodies to watch in 2022 paper, and we are documenting some 115 antibodies. So 115 is not a small number to you, and you can tell by this graph here that uh, it is a enormous increase from even just as recently as 2010. So really I want to congratulate everyone for having done such a great job and getting these molecules through the process. Now, if you're successful in phase three, of course, or late stage clinical studies, hopefully your molecule, molecule moves on to regulatory review and potentially a first approval in either the US or the EU. And here again, industry has done very well. We are projecting at the moment, nine approvals to occur in 2021 in either the US or the EU, slightly down from 2020 but certainly within the range that I consider very good, which is six molecules to, well, to infinity if we could really get there, but uh, the record high so far has been up to 13. And I've been very pleased now to see that we've been hitting this minimum or what I now consider the minimum of six approvals every year since 2014. With this last slide, I just want to remark on, um, the number of approvals, if you look at the cumulative totals, which are shown in this slide, you can see that we have passed that milestone of 100 approvals in the US. And this was remarked on in an article put together by Asher Muller that was published in Nature Biotechnology just a little bit earlier this year. And I am pleased to say that the Antibody Society provided most of the data that's in the graphs and tables of that paper. We're expecting the European Union to follow along relatively shortly. Hopefully next year, they will also pass that same milestone. So again, 
Excellent work, everyone. Very well done. We are uh, getting molecules into the clinic, into regulatory review, and through to approvals at a very good pace. So with that as a little bit of background, uh, and we will now, I will now pass things over to Dr. Kukluvius to tell you how to get your molecule into the clinic. Yes, thank you, Jen, uh, for the introduction and for uh, paving the, um, the road to, um, to this topic. Um, my name is Bianca Clovius. Um, I'm, um, I have been working in the antibody fields uh, since my student times. And uh, um, I have uh, worked in, in small biotech as well as in big pharma, um, uh, including Roche. And um, I have uh, now currently, um, I'm um, as an advisor uh, and consultant, I'm chairing three companies and I'm CEO of a fourth company. So uh, I'm not uh, hands-on anymore on the preclinical development or clinical development, but still I would like to introduce you today to the topic because it's a very important topic um, um, that will uh, make or break your, your project already quite early in, uh, in your work. And it's very important that you plan ahead uh, um, very carefully and that you follow a certain path also very carefully. Um, so let me let me walk you through it. Uh, the, the first slide, uh, just uh, something that is also related to what Jan said before. So you can see that over the years, this year is looking at therapeutic antibodies uh, and their history, <clears throat> that over the, the years, the, uh, the number and, uh, of, of therapeutic antibody was increasing very fast. Uh, and that also the importance uh, and the clinical impact of, uh, um, of therapeutic antibodies on, on the treatment of diseases was immense. Uh, um, nowadays, you can't think about oncology anymore, uh, oncology uh, uh, therapy without having uh, a couple of uh, di uh, antibodies in your mind immediately. And also over the years, uh, ad additional um, indications came into uh, came into the picture, like autoimmune diseases, for example, etc. You know the you know the story, but just to make it uh, clear again, how important uh, uh, the antibodies have been have been becoming in the last years. So if you look at the drug development process for antibodies, this is of course very very um, uh, simplified here. You have certain packages so to speak. You have the discovery and the development phase. In the development phase, you have uh, the time where you focus on clinical trials. You start usually off with identifying your compounds or a couple of compounds that are interesting for you. You test them. Um, for example, just the binding to the target molecule, etc. cetera. Um, and then comes the most important points. Uh, you select your clinical candidate and you perform your IND enabling package, which will allow you to come into the clinical phase. And today we want to focus on these two packages here because they are very crucial to, uh, um, for your project. If you do any mistakes here, you will not be able to enter the clinical phase. I mean, this is, as I said, a little bit oversimplified but uh, you should keep it in, in mind. In reality, uh, the reality, of course, is more complex uh, in life. And uh, uh, sometimes it feels more like this and not like this here. And, uh, but don't, uh, um, don't be afraid. It's not that bad. If you follow certain rules and you have uh, good advice from people who went through that process before, then uh, um, uh, you should be able to navigate that process. So uh, let's start with the first phase, hit to lead. So congratulations, you have some hits from uh, your screening process. What are you doing next? So the first step uh, is hit to lead. Make you out of your hits some leads. So you generated some hits, for example, uh, using phage display or other display technologies uh, by immunizing animals or other, uh, other methods. And you have now a, a handful of antibodies in your hands that bind to your, uh, to your target molecule X and that you would like to look at uh, more closely and uh, develop them further. So the first thing you do is you, second, you have to select lead candidates with the desired function, obviously. And here, and this I want to stress, 
uh, you have to rely or, or to look at your TPP, your uh, target product profile. Uh, so don't be shy to work on your TPP already very early in your project because it gives you always guidance. Your TPP, of course, is not a document that that is unchangeable. It should adopt. You should adopt it over the time, uh, obviously. But your TPP gives you guidance in uh, how you want to uh, to develop your 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 product, uh, what features uh, your product uh, should have. So here already, er, quite early, you have you are forced to make up your mind. For example whether you want a, a strong binding or only immediate binding to your target molecule, um, whether you, uh, you need certain uh, uh, aspects um, uh, like pH uh, resistance or uh, that it works in certain environments, etc. So very early in your project, you need to think about um, how your, your final product should look like so that you are now in this, in this early process uh, already able to uh, to design your experiments and to um, to steer your candidate selection into the right direction. So this is really critical. Your TPP do it as make it as early as possible. Your first your first uh, version. So in you you will select the candidates uh, looking at uh, biochemical biophysical properties like binding to the target like uh, a target specificity uh, um, specificity. Is it enough? Uh, that uh, it binds to the main target and uh, just a little bit stronger than to uh, uh, similar targets, for example. Um, or is it for uh, another question? Is it for you very important that your uh, target uh, that your binding is um, <clears throat> is happening only uh, in certain tissues of the body and so on? So this is very important that uh, that you test this already here, and you have to to design the tests according to these questions. You will look at expressibility, of course, because uh, an antibody that has a good binding but is uh, a nightmare to express is maybe not the right candidate for you to work on. And uh, you look at in vitro efficacy. So for example, um, in, in an oncology project, you would look at uh, a killing efficacy in vitro, whether the antibody uh, is killing uh, uh, tumor cells, etc. So these are the very first readouts that gives you an idea about about your your candidates that you have here or your hits. You would maybe already perform epitope mapping if you want, uh, for example, that your antibodies is binding to a certain epitope on your target molecule, and you could and maybe should already induce here. Uh, um, um, small animal uh, testing program. I mean, if you have like five or six hits or maybe 10 and you want to collect out the leads here, you looked at the bio, uh, at all these uh, properties and you maybe have reduced the number to half. Another step that <clears throat> helps you to funnel down the number of your, your molecules is that you look in an animal model, for example, for tumor killing uh, in vivo efficacy. Uh, and then you have very early already proof of concept, which is um, if you are working for a biotech company, which is uh, uh, imp an important thing because it would already lead to an increase of the, the valuation of your, your company because you have here relatively early then already quite important data that you can show to potential seed investors uh, or so you could show them that you have a candidate in hand that is doing the job at least in, in animal models. So that's, uh, um, <clears throat> I would recommend to have this kind of animal readout relatively early. You don't need to go up with the animal number too high, just you want to show the principle that it works. Your next uh, block of activity is then to uh, select uh, your your clinical candidate. So maybe you have still two or three leads, maybe you have reduced everything to one lead. Uh, the next step is to make out of your lead a, a clinical candidate. So uh, you have a couple of different activity fields that you that you have to, uh, that you can perform here. And again, with everything you do, keep your TPP in mind. The first block of activities that I mentioned here is the so-called lead optimization, where you optimize your molecule according to, to your TPP and your wishes. Uh, if you have, for example, an, a, a molecule 
that is uh, coming out of um, an animal um, an animal vaccination program, maybe you need to humanize your antibody. You, if you have a candidate that is binding the right molecule and the right target and the right epitope, but maybe your affinity is not there where you want it, you should perform affinity maturation. You can check your uh, your antibody uh, whether uh, and there are there's enough material and, and tools that you can use for that. Uh, whether this is potentially immunogenic or parts of the molecule, obviously, you you can uh, you can uh, introduce uh, um, uh, de immunization uh, um, activities to reduce the overall immunogenicity of your protein of your antibody if this is needed. In some cases, you might want to engineer uh, um, details of your FC depending on on your question and your uh, mode of action of the antibody that you want to work with. So this is one block of uh, activities uh, for lead optimization. <clears throat> if you have then uh, the, the molecule in the shape um, that you want, you should go again through um, a process of characterization, but this time much more in detail compared to before um, when, you, when you had your, your, uh, your lead uh, selection process. Now you go much more into detail uh, looking at the uh, characterization of your candidate. Um, and this is a list of things uh, you, you have to look at. And this is the minimal list. I mean, depending on um, the mode of action that you're targeting, for example, um, you can add here additional uh, characterization activities, of course, but this here is the minimum that I believe uh, every antibody uh, candidate should go through. The one is very important, CMC-related uh, properties. You look at expression rates, glycosylation, aggregation, etc. So everything that has to do with the manufacturing process, uh, you have to look here, uh, whether it's, it's, it's good enough or whether you need to, to change something in the, in the process or in the molecule to get better CMC-related properties. This is extremely important, and some people try to, uh, some people tend to underestimate um, the importance of this point. Um, but you know, uh, if you if you have later a process that is very painful and very very uh, cost-intensive, it can really uh, make your your whole project attractive. Uh, for further development. So keep this in mind and have a good look at it. And don't be shy to talk to external experts in that field. There are some, uh, there are many around that can give you really good advice here. If you don't have it in-house, take advice from an expert. You don't want to make any mistakes here. So uh, uh, connected to that is manufacturability, like scalability, final expression systems, etc. So this is all under the same umbrella. Another important point, of course, is now having again an in vivo proof of concept um, <clears throat> a study in animal model. Uh, this time, you would do it in a in a larger with a larger amount of animals, so that you can uh, get um, you know statistically uh, reasonable uh, numbers out of that. Um, you would look into biodistribution in animals um, to make sure that your antibody is going into the preferred uh, tissues where you want to have it and not accumulating in tissues where you don't want to have it because of potential tox reasons, for example. Um, this point is also important that you look at that now. Uh, you assess the relevant animal species for your further development. Um, later, we come to the point of, uh, of IND enabling package and toxicity. And there, you always need to have two uh, animal species um, working uh, to work with, and one of them has to be a non-rodent species. So it's now already important to assess whether, for example, uh, uh, monkeys or dogs are your best second uh, uh, second uh, animal species, or or something else. Uh, you have to find out now because you want to be prepared when you start your IND enabling package, and the question uh, arises, and you want to to be prepared so that you don't lose time at that time. You can do this in parallel to all the activities up here, so you don't lose any time. <clears throat> here also, you can uh, induce a first exploratory small uh, PKPD study in animals. Uh, what you what some people do is when they when they uh, are working with their uh, proof of concept efficacy model, 
they also enable uh, um, and and uh, design the 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 this this animal experiment in a way that they can also uh, collect uh, PKPD uh, uh, data as well as here safety data um, for the from the animals. So if you can combine that, it's the better. The less animals you have to use, it's good uh, for animal benefit, of course, and it will reduce your costs tremendously if you are able to do that. And here again, I would suggest to you, if you don't have a really good uh, animal lab and uh, experienced people in uh, in-house, um, go to a very experienced um, service provider, um, then you are uh, usually in good hands and uh, they can do these things for you uh, maybe better than, than any of your postdocs could do that. Um, <clears throat> the last point to consider is whether you want, uh, whether, which, whether you have already some ideas about uh, a potential biomarker uh, for your treatment. If you have an, uh, a therapeutic antibody, uh, you want to think about a biomarker that you can use as a surrogate uh, marker of efficacy. Uh, because sometimes it's, it's not easy to um, directly measure the efficacy of your antibody in oncology, for example, in a direct uh, and, and very clean matter. And sometimes it's, it's good to have a biomarker for the direct readout, so as for the indirect readout, but for uh, your final readout, or at least to confirm the data that you, that you see otherwise. So this is something you would like to start already here to have an idea which biomarker to use and that you start here to generate data that uh, validate your biomarker that you say, yes, with our antibody, it works in the system in vitro, at least for the beginning, you can show that this biomarker is reacting uh, to, to the treatment in, in a cell culture, for example, and you see a nice dose related uh, effect and so on. So you should uh, start working with a biomarker uh, program already now. <clears throat> Um, now we come to uh, the preparation of your clinical development. And if you remember at the, the, in, the, in the slide at the beginning, we had it very easy um, that uh, uh, one of the, la the last uh, block before the clinical development was the so-called IND enabling package. But uh, to, be, to be honest, there is more to do to prepare for your clinical development. So there come now three, uh, three slides uh, talking about different aspects um, that you should go through in preparation for your clinical development. We start with the, with the ominous IND enabling package, and I'm sure everybody has heard about that before. And those who didn't go through the process yet, um, I want to uh, present to um, at least, um, you know, the, the basics of an IND enabling package. Um, you have these basics that are always there and that you should always uh, work with in your IND enabling package. However, depending on, on, on your project, on your individual project, you, you might add here additional additional aspects and additional experiments um, that, that, will, um, that will help the regulatory authorities to get uh, um, a, an opinion on your on your uh, drug candidate but what we show here on this slide is so to speak the backbone of any ind enabling package um, what i would uh, always uh, recommend even if you have a good lab um, go to a service provider and and uh, and do outsourcing um, this package <clears throat> um, they do that uh, um, on a regular basis they know exactly what to do you can discuss with them these potentially necessary additional experiments as well. They can also help you with the paperwork and uh, with, with approaching uh, the authorities uh, uh, if needed. Um, at this time point, it's also advisable to have already uh, first contacts to your, uh, to your regulatory authorities where you want to submit um, just to, to, to get uh, some advice from them. And the, the most of these um, of these uh, regulatory bodies are uh, happy to, to give some guidance here. Um, so ask them uh, and don't be shy um, and tell them what you want to do and whether they have some special thoughts about your program. This could, for example, lead to, uh, to uh, that you have to add one or two uh, special experiments, for example, 
or that they say, okay, this is maybe uh, uh, not so important. And I come to an example at the bottom of the, of the slide. So let's start. The first block is uh, pharmacology. Uh, and the most important part of that is uh, safety pharmacology. You would assess the effect um, of your of your uh, pro of your uh, product candidate on the cardiovascular, the neurological, and the respiratory system of the animals. So that's very important. Um, usually, you would not expect something from from antibodies, but maybe you have um, a target molecule that is expressed in some of these uh, some of these tissues, and then you want to show that you don't have uh, um, at least in your animals not a negative effect. Second thing is uh, primary pharmacodynamics uh, um, that you want to see. Here, you want to define the therapeutic effect of your drug candidate. So um, the, the, the dose uh, relation of your effect or the exposure relation of your effect. You want to show um, in the animals that um, your drug is doing the job and hopefully in a dose-related manner. The second block is uh, PK, pharmacokinetics. Um, so first you would look in, in vitro. Um, you can start with that. Uh, um, you look at uh, whether you have some uh, metabolism, that, uh, metabolites. Usually this is not the case, but still uh, um, you should look at it and, 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 and show the data. And very important uh, also in the context of antibodies is plasma protein binding. So you want to show whether your antibody uh, is binding to plasma proteins and to which ones maybe, and uh, um, what is the binding uh, half-life, et cetera. So this gives you already uh, an idea also on the planning of your animal experiments, uh, where you look here in, in pharmacokinetics, you would uh, perform repeat dose toxicities uh, um, uh, to, uh, um, to look at, uh, sorry, not uh, toxicities wrong here, you should, perform repeat dose uh, treatments uh, to determine Cmax and AUC in your animals. And then you look at ATME um, if, you, if, if it's, uh, if it's advisable. And this is a, a question you can ask your authorities when you talk to them already here, uh, whether they want to see they, uh, these data now already or parts of it, or whether they want to see it later coming from, from human, uh, um, from human uh, data. So uh, sometimes this is waived. Um, um, sometimes uh, you have to show it. So this is one of the questions you could ask uh, the, the authorities. The third block is, um, is uh, that you look at acute toxicity, um, a single dose, uh, uh, it means in two animal species, one of them, as I said before, non-rodent. And this has to be performed in the clinical route of administration. So if you plan, for example, um, to have later um, an, an IV, you should also look, you, it has to be done in IV here, and it has to be done in a second parental route. So in that case, maybe uh, in, a second, in a second experiment, you would uh, apply it uh, subcutaneously. Um, here also you would do repeat dox toxicity and uh, what, what uh, uh, can be done uh, uh, sometimes, and that's why it slipped up to here, you can sometimes combine these uh, experiments, repeat dose tox and uh, um, repeat dose uh, injection for CMAX and AUC into one experiment um, with, uh, so you, you, you can uh, um, spare some time here. Um, you would look uh, into, uh, uh, into uh, um, uh, different doses, dose regimens. You know, you would uh, increase dose levels, for example, <clears throat> in your, in your uh, injections. And you want to determine no AEL, um, which is uh, uh, no adverse effect level, and MTD in your, in your animals. Um, so this is, this is an important data point or important data points, both of that. Uh, no IEL means just how much can I inject into the animals until, until I, as, and I don't, still don't see any negative side effects. Um, and the MTD is, is basically something similar. Uh, um, what is the maximal tolerated dose? And, and this, this is very important for your planning of your, your, the dose that you would uh, select for your for your first in human trials. So um, these these data are very important, and you have to uh, to be sure 
uh, and to make sure with your with your design that the data that you get out of that are in a way that you really can use them. So they have to be clean and they have to uh, they have to be clear also with their endpoint. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, because this is, as I said, this is uh, necessary uh, for the calculation of your human uh, uh, doses that you would use. You could look here maybe into mutagenicity, which is usually not use, not uh, uh, not necessary for antibodies. Same for embryo fetal toxicity, depending, but this could depend on your target again. Uh, immunotoxicity, this is something that is more important uh, to look at with antibodies. And you did, this is another point that you discussed at this point in time with the regulatory authorities. Uh, they will give you advice what they want to see and whether it's, for example, fine to, to bring these data later um, <clears throat> when you are running a phase three trial already or so, because uh, these two with antibodies uh, are more formalities and in most cases, except you have a special target that might have embryo fetal effects or so. Right, the second, uh, the second aspect that you need to look at to prepare your clinical development, obviously, is CMC. And again, as I said before, sometimes people underestimate the importance of this. Um, not is it, it, it's not only time consuming on this, on this package, it's also uh, quite complex. And uh, uh, um, also here, in many cases, so advisable to take the advice from uh, outside experts uh, into your company um, if you haven't uh, gone through this process uh, before. So, um, you know, during your, your early work, your discovery, and also uh, during long stretches of your non-clinical work uh, that we talked about before, it's okay to work with non-GMP material, obviously. But now that you come closer and closer to your clinical phase, you need GMP material, obviously. You need already GMP material for the uh, animal experiments in your IND enabling package. So you have to be prefer, uh, prepared. And, and uh, I don't want to go in, into the detail here, but you know the, the, the points to consider, you have to, to create your master cell line um, and, and you know uh, get, uh, get a good backup and storage, et cetera, to make sure that you always can go back uh, um, uh, if you if you need to produce uh, more of your material, another one is that you establish a manufacturing protocol. That is your final protocol that you can write a patent about. Um, for example, to help create a fence of IP around your your product. And one interesting part of that IP fence is always uh, manufacturing. And uh, so, if you have your final product. Send a, submit a, a patent for it. That makes sense. Um, you have to establish the way you want to upscale your process because uh, if you want, if you have to uh, to uh, create clinical batches, you need to to prepare for that in time. You have to have uh, a manufacturer who's doing the job for you, uh, and manufacturing and and etc. You have to think about uh, uh, what I just said, uh, getting GMP ba uh, uh, badges uh, produced, uh, uh, also your first clinical grade badge, um, and uh, that's, that's, that's very important. In parallel, you have to do things like stability, uh, uh, stability, stability tests uh, and, 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 and uh, such things that are uh, very important for you, and the authorities also want to see these data. Then uh, maybe the, the, the th should be a three here, apologies for that. So the third block in the preparation for a clinical development is documents and, and additional data and, and all that that I want to summarize here. <clears throat> and this is just uh, a list and there are other aspects that you could act, act, add to this list. So I just want to go through the most important ones that I, I find uh, uh, very important. So. If you have now your clinical candidate um, and you are working on your IND enabling package, make sure that you can that you thought about all these these things. So evaluation of your data, the, the scientific data, the binding data, the, your animal data, everything um, that all the data that you created with your candidate, and compare it with your TPP and be very honest whether the TPP is met. And if it's not met, 
then uh, um, you should think about whether you still you want to go back do some homework again or whether you can change the TPP um, in a way that is not harmful for your project. So you really have to be sure here and have the right uh, the right uh, um, confidence that uh, the candidate that you have is the right clinical candidate. Um, safety assessment is part of that uh, commercial reassessment. Um, um, so now, uh, since you started with the project, you are now um, a couple of years along the, the line again. So latest here, you should look again into your, your business case. Um, has something changed on the market? Are there now other antibodies in, uh, that are targeting the same target and uh, uh, indication, for example, that are ahead of you? And uh, if so, what? Uh, how strong are they as competitors? How far ahead are they of you? And uh, what could you do? You should think about that, that uh, here now. What could you do to uh, uh, to uh, to to show that your antibody is special and maybe you have some you you create some plans uh, that your antibody is not looking like one of the others but uh, showing some specialties um, you need to have your final legal evaluation so latest at this point i would recommend to get an fto analysis a freedom to operate analysis so hire a good uh, patent lawyer he will have a look around in the uh, patent uh, uh, in the patent universe and telling you yes to the currently available information uh, the uh, the field you intend to work with your product candidate is free for you to operate if this is not the case then you might infringe with, uh, uh, with the ip uh, of another player and then uh, uh, you should have a plan or you should generate a plan how you deal with that you could approach that that uh, that competitor, for example, and, and discuss things and get a license. Um, but uh, you also could go ahead and wait until you, the, until your infringement is seen or so, which I would not recommend, of course. So but you have to have um, uh, a final IP evaluation before you start here. Your clinical strategy, including uh, logistics, uh, CRO selection should be in place um, at a right time before you start with your clinical development and also, of course, your clinical development plan should. Your biomarker plan, we work, you worked on your biomarker before, we touched that briefly. You should have a plan uh, how you would um, look at your biomarker in the clinic. For example, that you say, okay, we want to uh, take blood cells 5, 10, and 15, as an example, and analyze there our biomarker. Um, so, But you have to have a plan for that. You need to know um, when you want to take blood, how much blood you want to take, etc., and how you want to analyze it, um, which labs to use for the analysis, etc. Your regulatory planning, of course, <laughs> needs to be in place, um, including the pre-IND meetings that I mentioned already, um, you have to think about uh, uh, um, the label, etc. You need to be have everything together um, for uh, to to approach your regulatory uh, um, um, authorities where you want to submit. And then again, back to manufacturing, you need to have your manufacturing homework done. You need to know how to manufacture, where to manufacture. You need to have an idea how much material you need at what time points during your clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot to think about. And also already, although it's quite early, you should start thinking about your, your product. So at the beginning, <clears throat> you, can be, you can be low tech uh, regarding fill and finish, but later at a certain time point, maybe uh, for phase twos, um, latest for phase threes, you need to have a proper packaging, uh, including a label and everything, uh, and a proper uh, fill and finish. Um, so bottles, for example, if you want, uh, if you go for liquid, etc. So you have to have this at least. Uh, some of these things have to be in place before you start with your clinical trial. Some have to be planned uh, way ahead still. And this now, just at the end, uh, um, is something that, um, as a if you if you are a small biotech company, you always have to uh, keep in mind. And this is cost and company valuation. So uh, I don't I don't want to give the impression that here cost and company evaluation are 
are the same, so the numbers are very different, but they, they move a little bit in a similar way. So let's have a look at the costs first. So in your discovery phase, the costs, they, they are moderate, they are increasing, but it's still, you know, you can handle that. Then the IND enabling package, that's, that's really a, a lot of money that you have to bring up. And then obviously your clinical trials, they, for that you need really a lot of money. So you, if you keep this in mind, you have to, you, you can plan ahead um, your uh, your fundraising so that you know, okay, I need to, to raise that and this and that amount of, of money uh, at this time point to be able to pay for, uh, for my activities. And that's very important to have an idea about that uh, in time. Um, in, but the good thing is also that the more data you create in your different activities, the more value um, you create uh, in your company. <clears throat> Interestingly, the value creation from the beginning to, uh, to have a candidate selected is moderate. So I wouldn't suggest to sell your company here because you didn't make much money or much, you didn't create so much value yet. Interestingly, the IND enabling package and even the phase one, they increase your value, but not so super much. So if you want to really, uh, um, to really think about a possible exit, uh, the, really, uh, the time points when you have increased the value of your company really tremendously is uh, after phase two, when you have a, a proof of concept data, when you can show, yes, my antibody is doing its job, it's killing tumor cells, I have an overall response rate of X, Y, Z, and, um, um, and you know you can show survival data, et cetera. This is an immense jump up of your value of your company. And the most, the most access, exits are actually done here. You could, of course, also go and uh, perform a phase three, but usually this is so cost intensive that uh, you do this only uh, with a, a big, strong partner, pharma company, for example, at your site. So this is just uh, to give you um, this kind of flavor um, where in this, in, this, uh, um, in, in this process, in this process chain, your value and your costs are moving. So that was that from my side. Um, again, my name is Björn Kochlovius. Um, I'm an independent consultant and I'm not doing only uh, um, drug development strategies and help biotech companies with that. I'm doing also uh, fundraising uh, and partnering. Um, I'm, I'm chairman in three companies and I'm CEO in a fourth. And uh, um, one of the most important things I believe and I uh, enjoy always is to get to know new people and to network because um, this is such an important field we work in. I believe it's important that we exchange knowledge and experience to make, to create better drugs for our patients. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. We do have a few questions. Let me just start with the first one, which is what are the analytical methods to be developed for PK, PD, biodistribution, et cetera? Okay. Um, there, are, there are a number of uh, different possibilities. Look, let's look at biodistribution. Um, um, some of these you can do uh, in your lab in case you have a small animal facility in the house. Uh, these are uh, labeling your antibody and then taking uh, uh, taking images, whole body images of your of your animal. If you have, for example, um, what I always like to do, um, if it's easy um, and low cost, you have uh, try to find an an academic uh, a collaboration partner who maybe has the possibility to put your mice into uh, into a CT or so. And then you look at uh, the pictures you, uh, you can see there, um, depending on the label, you have then to use different imaging uh, technologies. And there are a couple you can, you can choose, uh, radioactive labels, non-radioactive labels, uh, et cetera. It depends also on the, the grade of, um, um, how you say, uh, how, 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 how well you want to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to test that. Um, so this, not a specificity, sorry, I'm blanking on the English word now, 
how how low you can go with the um, uh, with your um, with your binding to still see a picture. I'm just blanking on the on the expression. I'm sorry for that. Um, so the more uh, um, fine tune uh, you want to your system, also you can choose different methods for that. Thank you very much. Next question: What is the extent of exploratory PKPD and tox that you would do? Mm in lead um, compared to a candidate. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, uh, so um, not everybody is doing that and it's not really mandatory to do it. Uh, some, some, uh, in some cases, um, it might be advisable. For example, you have um, the idea that your antibody might be toxic because it's uh, binding to a certain target that might induce some toxic effects it would be advisable to look in your animals uh, here at the toxicity effects if you for example um, have uh, the idea that there might be some liver tox um, um, created with your antibody then i would recommend to look in animals with your antibody and check for liver toxicity you don't need to go up with, with high uh, animal numbers if you have a handful of animals that's that's fine enough but you want to get an idea whether one of your candidates is especially bad with liver toxicity or one is especially good then you would work with that so this is something and and with uh, um, uh, that's with the toxicity with pk and uh, um, it's it's uh, something that you would like to see whether in principle for example um, your antibody is stuck in a certain organ because it's, it has some unspecific binding to a certain organ. You could see that there or um, whether it, it has a very strong binding to human serum albumin, uh, you know, in, in, for example, in, in, your, in, in the periphery. In some cases, it might be good if you want to prolong your, the half-life of your antibody, then you're happy if it's binding to uh, a serum albumin. You know, these things always de depend on your project and then your antibody and uh, um, <clears throat> can be, uh, should be looked at very individually. Thank you for that answer. Next question in general, how long after your candidate is selected does it take to complete a basic IND enabling package? Yeah, that depends on a couple of, uh, on a couple of uh, points. The most important is, do you have enough material available to, uh, to go through your IND enabling package in one run? So whether you can have whether you have one batch produced and you can say okay with this batch we are able to to do all the necessary experiments uh, for your IND enabling package that would be ideal of course uh, the second thing is that uh, um, you know it depends a little bit on on the uh, the external partner that you choose and uh, there are some that might be slower uh, than others. And uh, a third point is, and, and that you, you find out when you, when, you do, uh, when you do your due diligence uh, during your, uh, uh, your CRO selection, they, you will ask them for um, historic data, you know, and they, they will have to show you how long they usually take in average for such a project. And then you can uh, uh, do your selection accordingly. Another point is that if you, if you have some special animal requirements, uh, you know, species that are not so easy available in some exotic cases, um, then you have to maybe uh, um, plan for that uh, if you have to go into, I don't know, ferrets for whatever reason. And then you have to there, you know, uh, these animals are not so easily available maybe. So all these things you have to consider, but in, in, in average, um, an IND enabling package, you can, if you are, everything has prepared and you have your material together, a year to one and a half. That's, that's I would say, a normal, a normal timeline. Excellent. Very good. That's quite helpful. Uh, next question is, which studies in the IND enabling package have to be GLP? Uh, oh. You may have... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that Sorry. was a very thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was super that, easy. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and that's that's why uh, it's it's not a bad idea to go to a service provider because they have this as standard. You don't have to have any headaches if you try to do it yourself. You will never be able to um, to 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 reach the timelines that they can reach because they do this on a day-to-day -day basis. 
if you want to do this in-house, I really would uh, would not recommend that. So go to a service provider, they know what to do and they do everything uh, uh, on higher standards. Even if it's not necessary that the one or the other part uh, is in GLP, they will still do it just to have everything safe and sound. Excellent advice. Mm -hmm. Are there substantial differences between data package requirements by regulators in the US versus the EU versus Asia? That is, so I guess the question is really around how much harmonization has actually occurred? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, um, so the backbone of the IMD enabling package that I showed you is the same in, 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 uh, with the FDA, with the EMEA, with the, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, it's, it's the same. Uh, the Chinese, uh, they uh, they changed their regulations over the last couple of years. They started with that five, six years ago. And then they are now also following uh, uh, the same standards uh, um, for that as we do. In some countries, um, they uh, the authorities want to see um, additional data. Um, they don't need to be there uh, as a part of the IND enabling package, but they come usually then during the uh, during the uh, clinical development of your product. Uh, for example, uh, Japanese authorities want to see uh, PKPD data performed in a small group, at least, of uh, 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 Japanese uh, uh, patients. Uh, this is something in Japan. They want to see that because the Japanese authorities uh, postulate that the Japanese population is genetically uh, uh, different enough from, for example, Caucasians, that is uh, that it's uh, a good idea to do that. So they usually ask for that. Uh, Chinese authorities uh, uh, do something similar as well, but these are data that you can bring uh, that you bring with your patients. So you don't need additional animal experiments or something like that. Uh, these additional things usually come uh, show up during your your clinical development. Um, just then as, an, as a, uh, an, an outlook to the clinical development, if you, if you are uh, um, thinking already very early that you want to not to lose so much time between your launch in, let's say the US and EU and the launch in Japan and China, then you would include such additional uh, uh, clinical trials and clinical experiments already very early in your clinical development. Very good. Thank you. Last question, is cross-species target binding important given some genes may not be conserved across different species? Also, if tox issues can be addressed at yeah. in vivo level rather than, or in vitro level rather than in vivo? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, it, this, is, this is part of uh, the selection of your, your animal species uh, for uh, um, for your uh, tox packages in in IND, for example, um, it's it's very important that the antibody is binding to if you have the mouse as your rodent um, that it binds to the mouse uh, protein, not only to the human protein but also to the mouse protein. So this is at the cross uh, species cross specificity that you should. Uh, aim and that should be part all already of your of your candidate selection, your lead selection even. Um, the 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 uh, also it's uh, it would be it's necessary um, or it's it's beneficial that it binds to a second a second uh, a species. For example, salmonologous monkeys. It's uh, very usual, and you can you can uh, select for these binders, and you should select for these binders. The um, it's it's close in it's close enough to human structure usually that you, you you find such binders, but you have to to search for them in in your library, for example. Um, so have that because then you will be able to do your your IND enabling package without any headache. If you don't have these kind of cross uh, species uh, um, um, binding, then you run into complications. Uh, you have to look for surrogate marker, markers. Uh, you have to look for um, mouse models that are humanized and and are you know not so easy to handle and maybe even uh, also uh, quite expensive, etc. So if you don't have this binding, it makes your life very hard, uh, especially during the IND enabling package. So if you if you want to avoid these headaches, try to get uh, um, antibodies that 
show this cross species uh, specificity already during your lead uh, selection. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was our last questions. So in, very welcome. <laughs> in concluding, I'd like to thank Dr. Kaklovius for relating his amazing insights into the preclinical development of antibody therapeutics. And thank you very much for joining the webinar today. An on-demand version will be available in a few days. I will send a link to it to everyone who registered. Please feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.